the AI for Good Global Summit convened by ITU recognizes the joint responsibility of governments, the private sector, United Nations agencies, academia and others to ensure AI reaches its full potential while preventing and mitigating harms. And it's a moment that calls for action. And today I'm calling on each of you, each of you to use this summit to help the world to better understand what kinds of regulations, what kinds of guardrails we need to put in place right now. So together, let's make it innovative, let's make it safe, and let's make it responsible for all. Thank you very much. Welcome to AI for Good, the leading action-oriented, global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end to chat, connect, ask questions, and network with our distinguished panelists and world-class AI experts in the neural network. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Hello everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar session today for the 2023 AI ML and 5G Challenge. My name is Mia Nishio with ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, the United Nations Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies. The Machine Learning in 5G Challenge now in its fourth year aims to create a community to solve network-related problems using machine learning. We are hosting webinars all year round related to topics to do with both 5G and AI. Our speaker today, Michaela, who is currently a senior fellow at AMD Research, where she leads a team of international scientists doing amazing research in computer architecture for AI, green AI, and agile compiler stacks, will be presenting her research today. The title of today's session is Pervasive and Sustainable AI with Adaptive Computing, where Michaela will discuss how adaptive devices paired with agile compiler stacks can provide solutions by delivering post-production hardware specialization and co-designed algorithms, the ob objective of which is to create a highly optimized AI system that can achieve scalability and also a reduction in carbon footprint. We are counting on you, the participants, to help create an engaging discussion. If you have any questions, please type them in the video wall and we will take them during the Q&A session right after the talk. Without further ado, I would like to hand over the floor to Michaela. Thank you very much, Mia, for the kind introduction. Let me start sharing my screen. So, um, making sure everyone can see it. Um, we so, can see your screen. Excellent. Thank you, Mia. So thanks so much for hosting me. I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to be part of the seminar series. Uh, with my talk on pervasive and sustainable AI and how we can enable this through our adaptive computing architecture. But before we get there, let me just give you some uh, tiny bit of background on me and my team so you get a better understanding of who we are and where we come from and what we do for a living. Okay, so advancing slides. So we're part of the global AMD research organizations where I'm heading a lab called the Integrated Communications and AI Lab, in short, Radical. Uh, the team was established uh, over 18 years ago. Um, at the time, it was Silinx Research. Today, we're around 20 researchers, so top class PhDs accompanied by our university program and spread over five different locations from all the way from the US to Europe, to, to Singapore. So the focus as given by the name of the lab is AI and communications and everything that is at its intersection. 
Um, our approach to research is much less paperwork. It's much more hands-on. So we're building full systems. We're doing architectural exploration. We're carrying out algorithmic optimizations and also a lot of benchmarking to keep ourselves honest. And everything we're doing is in close collaboration with partner companies, with many advanced customers. So for example, most recently Sigagi in Germany, and with a lot of universities. So for example, we have a, a long-standing collaboration with ETH Zürich for over the 12 years with Paderborn, Imperial College, and TNU and many others. I'd also like to take a moment and advertise our internship program. Um, we, it's highly active, so in running for, I think, since um, over 12 years with typically up to 10 PhD students um, hosted in our labs. I would say probably over 100 have come through it by, by now. Okay, so that's all on the background that I wanted to give you. So let us uh, slowly ease into the subject. So the potential of AI is huge, right? And, and in my head, there's three reasons why that is the case. Um, First of all, AI requires little domain expertise to solve problems, which means you can solve problems that you don't really understand yourself. Secondly, neural networks have the mathematical pro property of being a universal approximation function, which means the, the scope of the problems that we can solve is really vast. And finally, if you make them big enough and you train them hard enough, um, they can outperform humans or existing algorithms on very specific tasks. And because of this, they are starting to replace existing implementations and more importantly, help us solve previously unsolved problems. To give you some examples here, the big news this year were of course, text image and code generation with large language models and GPT-4 is now even passing the bar exam. By the way, not just on average, it's passing on the 90th percentile, which is a, a big deal. And for me, the most significant example is probably the, the protein folding, which was, I mean, an unsolved problem for 50 years in computational biology, which was then solved a couple of years ago by Google's DeepMind with, with the neural network called AlphaFold. And today, right, we can successfully predict, I think, close to all 3D structures of nearly every catalog protein known to science, which is a huge deal for drug discovery and perhaps perhaps even a cancer cure eventually. Who knows? So in any case, um, coming back to what we're concerned here, we see increasing adoption in many, many application domains from cloud to edge and everything in between. So in essence, AI will become pervasive. And most of the focus and the hype is clearly with the hyperscalers work around large language models, uh, ChatGPT, web search, recommenders. And all of this is, of course, super cool. But this talk is much broader and includes everything outside the data centers, too. So we're interested in how can we address this long tail of AI beyond the hyperscalers and their large language models. So we'll, we'll take a look how to enable applications in communications, in medical, in airspace, in IoT, in precision agriculture, and, and things like that. So what are the requirements here and challenges that we face when trying to address this broad spectrum of applications? And as you can imagine, we encounter truly different and truly diverse requirements. So let's start off with power requirements. They would be very different when deploying AI, let's say in a hearing aid, compared to a server card deployment in a data center. Performance in terms of throughput and latency and jitter varies. We have different requirements concerning about cost. I mean, everyone cares about cost, but there's different uh, price packets you can deal with. We um, are always concerned about accuracy, but again, there might be different requirements, let's say, when you're working in security compared to having a recommender system uh, suggesting the next video that you're going to watch. I.O. requirements change depending on what sensors and what network interfaces you are connected to, temperature ranges and functional safety. They have very different requirements, for example, in airspace and defense applications. So there's really a, a, a broad spectrum of requirements. 
To make this a little bit more concrete, here are some very specific examples from the diverse requirements we have faced in, in our engagements with customers. So in the IoT space, for example, I mean, we expected that you want to have a small resource footprint, low power, below 10 watts, all of that makes sense. Low latency and zero jitter were also driving metrics, and that makes a lot of sense for real-time applications. Perhaps less expected though was the requirement for dynamic input sizes, which related to a camera, which dynamically adjusts its resolution of the video it captures. Then we looked at applications in high frequency trading. And as you probably know, it's an arms race for executing trading decisions the fastest. And every nanosecond supposedly accounts for multi-million dollar advantages. So the DNNs here are being deployed as part of the trading decisions. So, and we can, so, so because nanoseconds count here, we encounter extreme latency requirements. Similarly, uh, we encounter nanosecond latency requirements in high energy particle physics. For example, when, when in interacting with CERN, uh, Europe's largest Hadron Collider, of course. So here, your the the collider um, captures all uh, a lot of data, right? It generates a data rate of around seven terabits per second, right? It's drinking from the fire hose, and the neural network decides. But which parts of the data actually show interesting images. So um, every nanosecond uh, that the neural network takes to decide would accumulate a huge amount of traffic that you simply can't really store anymore. So again, nanosecond latency plus the extreme throughput are critical here. Actually, um, a little bit slower than that as a requirement in communications yet, like really, uh, really tough data rates. I mean, if you're if you're deploying on a hundred gig Ethernet link, uh, you know you're dealing or four hundred gigabit Ethernet link, right? You're you're dealing with hundreds of gigabit per second, which translates for for sixty four byte packet sizes into hundreds of millions of inferences that the neural network has to execute. In addition, you have this requirement that you want to have direct streaming integration with your networking interfaces. So you don't want to have a separate runtime, a control processor that would call the execution from the neural network. Instead, what you really want is that the neural network gets triggered and fed directly by the network interface. Then you have a requirement for low latency in the context of machine learning enabled firewalls, right? Um, so here, the rule-based implementations are increasingly augmented with neural network-based malware classification to protect more proactively against new forms of attacks. And here, you also need to have really low latency. Um, and typically, uh, the customers would talk about less than a millisecond. So, and across the bank, we see in the communication space, custom requirements, custom operators, custom data types, custom tensor shapes, and cu custom kernel dimensions. And in the extreme case, where um, we've actually seen that the adding of actual DSPs into neural networks is uh, required. So this was actually published from Nokia Bell Labs in their DeepRx paper, where they're combining multiple neural networks with DSP functionality for channel estimation. So the summary here is that DNNs will increasingly penetrate both wireless and wire telecommunications. And it comes with a whole new range of requirements, including of course, the high throughput and the low latency. So upshot your requirements are really diverse, but the the cherry on the icing is that the workloads are also really dynamic because AI is still a highly active research area. Algorithms are still changing as the science isn't mature yet. So for example, what's the next data type? I mean, we started off with FP32 implementations back in 2012, then we moved to 8-bit integer. Now we have a lot of 8-bit floating point. What's next? Logarithmic number systems. There was a recent publication on, on MX data types, which use block scaling factors. What's um what what what's the ultimate data type that is best used? What's the next operator that changes the compute paradigm? Remember, transformers, they've arrived in 2012 and they are now everywhere. 
And what's the next generative paradigm? I mean, we went from variational autoencoders to generative adversarial neural networks, then denoising diffusion. There could be something totally disruptive again emerging in the coming months. And then you have the fundamentally new ideas like Hinton's forward forward, doing away with stochastic gradient uh, descent based backdrop altogether. And, and of course, the, the, the most common thing we encounter is when working with customers is that the workloads change during the development cycle. First of all, because models are continuously being optimized for accuracy, for example, but then the application might evolve too. So if you look at the 6G spec, that will only be finalized in 2028, but the first radio front ends have to meet the market in 2029. And you can't just wait until the spec is finalized and then do an implementation. So you have to start now, right? And then evolve your implementation with the spec. Upshot here is everything is in flux all the time. So AI becomes pervasive with workloads being diverse and dynamic. In addition to this, I also want to talk about sustainability. And while my example here is data center specific, which of course helps with emphasizing the problem. The point of course applies to AI in general. So to put it simply, the energy footprint of current AI deployment is unsustainable, right? So if you look at the estimated power consumption of ChatGPT cluster, it's 4.3 gigawatt hours. There is a source reference, but the numbers are changing all the time, but it is very high. And an AI cluster at Meta is estimated to consume between 53, that's where it's at today, and 561 terawatt hours, which is the expected value for the coming years. So that's a similar ballpark to whole industrial nations, right? So that 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 is really, really concerning. And the truth is that the current DNN algorithms represent a sledgehammer approach. It's It's crude and it's highly inefficient. So we're doing hundreds of kilowatts doing matrix multiply with loads of zeros in the middle. And then you compare this to the human brain. We're looking at 10 to the power of five factor of potential improvement. So the, the human brain is operating on 20 watts and I'm definitely not doing matrix multiply up there, right? So there's a lot of, of scope of how we can improve this stuff. And you can see early evidence of the paradigm shift to come. I mean, here are in the top chart, you can see Google Trends um, for, for sustainable AI. You can see the curve picking up. So I really expect this to happen. Looking back, one could say up till 2012, is, it was mostly about getting DNN to work, to producing actually good accuracy. And then the next 10 years after that, it was about scaling up and scaling out. And the next 10 years will be energy efficiency. So the industry number one approach to energy efficiency and performance scalability, by the way, as well, is to specialize the hardware architectures as more slow as at the end. We can't just go to a smaller technology node anymore. And everyone is doing this, right? So you have the hyperscalers with Google's TPU, Alibaba, Huawei Ascend, AWS with the Inferencia, for example. And then you have a whole range of startups like Grok and Craftcore and Cerebras working on this too. And even in the automotive space with Tesla, who are making their own specialized hardware uh, themselves. So everyone is doing this. But the challenge with the specialization is that it takes time. So typically, one would look at two to three years for a custom device. If you look at your standard waterfall process here, right, you start with application analysis, then you progress to architectural specification, RTL design, followed by physical design, and, and so forth, and software compiler design, which is, by the way, often underestimated. It's probably more likely to be 50% of the total de uh, development time. And this is then followed by test and maintenance. So that's a challenge when your requirements are highly in flux. So let me illustrate this. So what happens is say we get requirements for a ResNet 50 and an Int 8, and some of you might remember the days 
<laughs> um, so we, we will start up with um, the application analysis, architectural specification and progress then down the waterfall and we're halfway through RTL design and in uh, come on people found that vision transformers work way better and FP8. So the problem is that that development cycle is just way larger than the available time. Uh, so the development time, sorry, is, is way larger than the available time. So, so you don't have enough time to spin a device and a solution. So what we really need to get is a mu uh, much more agility in this process. To sum it up in a nutshell, so on one side, we need to cater for dynamic and diverse requirements. And for this, we need agility and fast turnaround times. And on the other hand, we need to, for energy efficiency, we require a high degree of specialization, which typically involves long development cycles. And both of these aspects, of course, are in conflict with each other. So upshot is agility and customization is king. So the approach that we pursue is enabling rapid specialization with adaptive compute fabrics and agile AI stacks. And this involves three components. So the first is the lowest layer, which is the adaptive compute fabric in itself. The second layer is having customizable hardware execution architectures post silicon. And the third component is an agile AI stack. And so we have built this with our project Brevitas and Fin. Let me show you now in more detail how it works. So we'll work through these three layers now step by step. So let's start off with the adaptive compute fabrics, which is basically code name for FPGAs and AI engines. Let me introduce these briefly. So FPGAs are the chameleon amongst the semiconductors. They are flexible, adaptive, mostly homogeneous hardware architectures that enable you to post-production customize at the architectural level. So it's, it's like programmable hardware. You can customize the IO, you can customize the functionality, uh, for example, you can configure it to do a compression or an encryption or a neural network accelerator, whatever you like. And you can customize the compute architecture and the memory subsystem to meet the specific use case performance or energy targets. And uh, I'll, I'll show you in the layer two on how to customize it. And that gives you then improved energy efficiency. So they'll consume more energy than an ASIC for a specific circuit because the programmability comes at a cost. But overall, it can become more energy efficient as I can specialize the circuit more than I can afford to with a custom device. So physically, um, they are composed of a sea of lookup tables, like as shown in the diagram. The latest device, for example, would have millions of them. These lookup tables are interconnected with a programmable interconnect. There's programmable I.O. And finally, the fabric is interspersed with DSP elements, which can carry out n-bit multiply accumulates, as well as a lot of embedded SRAM blocks, giving you hundreds of megabit of distributed on-chip capacity in the largest devices with extremely high access bandwidth. So the talk's going to focus on FPGAs foremost, but I'd also like to mention the AI engines, which are a newer, more specialized form of an adaptive compute fabric. So they, they offer a little bit more higher performance for ML optimized data types through hardened vector processing in VLIW cores. The, um, compared to the FPGA, you could say that the AI engines operate on a word base, whereas the FPGA gives you the bit level granularity in configuring it. The fabric is also similar to the FPGA, highly flexible for interconnecting all the cores. And um, structurally, it's like a matrix of VLIW processors, flexible interconnect, tightly coupled embedded memory. We're talking tens of megabytes. And finally, compared to the FPG, this is much more software programmably, whereas the hardware, it's, uh, it's a hardware design that you're really doing. So as mentioned, uh, this talk is mostly about the FPGA-based approach. The beauty of the FPGAs are that they are already incredibly diverse because they're the chameleon, right? And they're already widely deployed from dishwashers all the way to Mars rovers. So we literally have 100 product families spanning silicon nodes from 350 to 7 nanometers. 
We offer over 500 base parts with different fabric sizes, you know, number of lots, different mixtures between lots of DSPs or depending on the application domains, as well as different combinations of high-speed serial I.O., analog to digital converter, for example, for RF, uh, HPM memory, ARM cores, and other IP. And there's different temperature grades, speed grades, and, and red hat versions per space deployment and things like that. So hey, just to put it simply, there's a huge range of parts that really can cater for the diverse requirements in pervasive VI. That's that's the message here. So, so much about the lower la uh, lowest layer with the adaptive compute fabrics. So on to the next component now, which is the customizable hardware execution architecture, which is remember the most important way to scale energy efficiency and performance. So how can we customize the hardware architecture? And remember uh, the beauty here is that with the FPGA, we can afford to customize more than you can with another um, semiconductor. So we have three tricks that we leverage. The first one is a customized data flow architecture. So we actually specialize the hardware for the specifics of a neural network. So it's not just a neural network accelerator in general. The second trick is quantization, which is, of course, super popular in the machine learning space, where we optimize the data types to the minimum precision required. And finally, sparsity, where we minimize the connectivity in the neural network and implement it with sparse neural circuits. So let's go through these now one by one, starting with the data flow. So as just mentioned, with data flow, we're specializing to the specifics of an individual so to, uh, topology. So for example, we would build an accelerator for ResNet 50. So in, in the hardware in essence, instantiates the topology as a data flow architecture. So every layer gets recreated in the hardware, whereby we allocate proportional the compute resources according to the compute requirements in the individual layers. For example, if the first layer would uh, need 2x the amount of compute to the second layer, then I would gi give it 2x the amount of real estate inside the FPG. What comes out of this is then a balanced data flow implementation. It's like a pipeline where I can then just stream the inputs through my accelerator. So the benefit here is because I customize everything to the specifics of a given DNN, uh, its operations and its connectivity, it becomes way more efficient. So let's talk a little bit more in, in, in the details of this. So, so why is it more efficient? Well, firstly, like just said, the architecture only computes and stores what's really needed, which makes, so there's only the memory that I need. There's only the operators in that specific neural networks that I've created in the hardware. Secondly, we're minimizing the movement and storage of data because we don't have to buffer the activations in between the layers anymore. So uh, the, the activations just stream from one layer into the next, right? And that saves huge amounts of energy. So just have a look at the energy per operation. This is for a seven nanometer fabric in the TPU V4 paper. A DDR three or four access costs 1,300 picojoules, right? And by a standard arithmetic operation ranges from 0 0.007 to 1.48 picojoule. So by not going to memory and just streaming the outputs from one layer into the next, you save a lot of power. And finally, I get high efficiency through overlap of communications and compute. So each layer starts computing as soon as the previous layer, uh, the inputs from the previous layers are available. And the weights are streaming into the layer in perfect time to carry out the compute. Data flow is not only energy efficient, it also helps with scaling to the diverse requirements. So as, as mentioned earlier, the physical hardware already comes all the right types and sizes. So the data flow allows me now to adapt the neural network to devices ranging from a few thousand LUTs all the way up to the millions of floods. So it really scales. Here's how. So um, as mentioned a moment ago, each layer is created in the hardware. So you have here a four layer neural network recreated in a small device and the compute resource in each layer 
are getting proportional amount of hardware resources in the fabric. As a result, when scaling to a larger device, say a 10x larger device, I can leverage 10x more resources for each of the layers and thereby scale the performance by 10x. And the same happens when progressing to the largest device. And so with Dataflow, I can really scale performance and resources to reach different points in the design space spectrum and meet the diverse requirements, including the extreme throughput requirements you would have, for example, in the com space. And note for the insider, it doesn't require batching like you would do on a GPU and the associated latency penalty that you would come from that would come with that. How do we enable the scalability uh, of each of the layer instances? Well, we leverage for this a parametrizable kernel library. So the, the kernels represent individual layers, which can be parametrized. First of all, with regards to the degree of parallelism. So how many output input channels and kernel dimensions do I want to process in parallel? This way we achieve different performance uh, and resource trade-offs. We can also parametrize the data types um, so, sorry, this was uh, the, the uh, level of parallelism. We can parameterize the data types, for example, int8 or ternary or binary or int2, more on that than in the coming parts. And I can parameterize its behavior, for example, what activation function to use. So these blocks are then composable through streaming I.O. and you can easily assemble a multi-layered neural networks with different combinations of kernels. And this whole thing is written in synthesizable C++, which can then be pumped through the high-level synthesis tool, which will generate from the C++ a hardware description. So the second trick in the bag is quantization. And this is a very popular approach in the machine learning space. Um, the, just in the case of uh, that, that some people haven't heard about it. It's an approach where you reduce the bits in the data representation of weights and activations while preserving accuracy. Why is it such a big deal? Well, firstly, reducing precision shrinks the hardware cost and scales performance. So for integer data types, the lot cost is proportional to the bit width in weights and activations. For example, between int1 and int8, I save 70x the resources. And that's a huge deal, right? Because now I can either shrink the circuit by 70x or I replicate it by 70x. And because everything is so parallel in your network, that would give me a performance scalability of 70x. Secondly, it saves energy too. Um, firstly, the faster execution time means less energy because energy is power times execution time. Secondly, using reduced position operators inherently uses less energy. Um, if you have good eyesight, you might be able to read the table here, but uh, there's basically orders of magnitude between let's say a 32-bit and, and an 8-bit operator. And, and also, right, uh, it will save my uh, energy because my memory footprint shrinks and maybe it shrinks so much that I can actually contain the full model on, on chip. And then I don't have to go and do the costly memory accesses. So there's a lot of energy benefits from reduced position. The last trick in the bag is using sparse neural circuits. And let me go into more detail here. Um, so DNNs are naturally sparse. Um, actually, uh, there is massive scope to improve machine learning eff efficiency through sparsity because it's been established, this is a quote from Nomenda, that the human brain is highly sparse, uh, supposedly 98% on average. I might be a little bit sparser early in the morning, I don't know. But uh, anyway, so compared to what we're doing with um, our electronic circuits, there's a lot of scope to improve this. So we had an idea. Um, well. Hold on, let, let me finish this, uh, the next point first. So sparse topologies, the challenge is, of course, that they translate into irregular compute patterns. And irregular compute patterns are hard to accelerate with vector matrix-based execution units, right? You're gonna do a lot of multiplication and additions with zero, which is wasted energy. 
The beauty with the data flow and the streaming implementations is that in the case where every neuron and, and every synapse is represented in the hardware, I can actually represent a completely irregular compute graph inside the FPGA and through that become much more efficient. So in the extreme case, and that's what we've done with the Logic Nets project, is what we, we said was that these lookup tables in the FPGA there's six binary inputs and a binary output. They're actually equivalent to a neuron, right? And once uh, you're thinking about it in, in that way, right, you can actually turn the whole problem on its head. What you can do now is, so rather than taking a neural network, optimizing it for hardware execution, and then deploying it, what we do now is we just pick a circuit in the FPGA and we say that is the neural network. And then we represent that circuit in the training framework and, and let with the training framework learn at the machine learning task. And if we get the accuracy, then we actually have maximum performance by design. So it's kind of the ultimate in, in co-design to sp speak. And that will give you even higher efficiency and maximum performance by, by design. Right, so up until now, we have talked about flexible hardware, the parameterizable execution architectures, and that allows us to create these highly specialized and highly efficient accelerators. But how can we pull this into a solution now? So how can we automate the creation of these flexible architectures and speed up the development cycles? And I'll, I'll show you this on the next couple of slides. So how do we do this? How do we go from this classical waterfall on the left-hand side to something more like on the right? So something equivalent to the agile process in common software practice. So first of all, the adaptive compute fabrics already helps, right? There's no more physical design needed. And because we have parameterizable data flow architectures, it removes the need for the architectural design and shrinks the RTL to just an incremental update, really. The trick is now to pair this with a training library for code design, right? And the graph compiler, which automates the specialization. And put this together, this enables you then with these rapid iterations that we need. So Finn and Brevetas are an example of such an agile stack and um, agile AI training library and compiler stack. So put together, they provide an end-to-end -end flow from DNN all the way to Bitstream, which enables automated generation of highly customized hardware architectures using all the tricks in the book, like quantization, data flow, fine granular sparsity. The key components are our training library Brevitas, the Fin compiler, which generates the hardware, uh, whereby the compiler leverages the HLS kernel library that we discussed earlier. And uh, really important to mention that everything here is developed in the open source domain. And that's really important because it enables fast customization. Uh, it, uh, it enables third party contribution and makes it much easier to collaborate. So let's take a closer look now at Brevidas and the Fin compiler. So Brevidas is the PyTorch library offering agile quantization support. What does that imply? It means, first of all, it allows for custom data types at the framework level. For example, arbitrary precision integers, floats with potentially block style quantization. It's also extendable for user-defined data types and operators and can support any hardware specifics at training type. Secondly, it's also composable building blocks, which can be arbitrarily combined. For example, you can do quantization aware training or data free post training quantization with data type of your choice. And this makes the quantization support much more agile and easy to adapt to new requirements. And finally, it offers integration with different compiler stacks. So, of course, the Fin compiler stack, but you can also use it for quantizing. Uh, your neural network for SendDNN and to run on the CPU or MI GraphX for GPU execution. So the output from Brevitas is an Onyx description, which is then ingested by Fin. So the Fin compiler imports the representation from Brevitas. It implements a modular graph compiler with well-defined abstraction levels, which incrementally lowers the Onyx graph to a hardware description through transformations. 
As part of that, it performs optimizations such as layer fusion and explores the design space. So it, it can calculate the degree of parallelism for each of the kernels using resource cost and performance models. Subsequently, it generates um, C++ descriptions using the parameterizable uh, kernel library and creates from this the DNN hardware IP, which looks like something uh, here on the lower right hand side. It's a four layer topology, for example, um, I think relatively easy to um, recognize. So let me show you some example results now. So we'll start off with a benchmarking exercise. Uh, here, we're not taking accuracy into account. So some applications might be amenable to quantization, some might not. So what we're doing here is just looking at the energy potential. So we've carried out benchmarking activity across topologies, devices, and optimization schemes to understand what concept gives you gives the most benefit. We have two examples um, uh, on MLP on the left-hand side and the CNV on the right-hand side with quantized and pruned implementations created with FIN on FPGAs. So let me explain the box and viscous chart. So each box represents a whole range of measurements over different batch sizes. The groups are differentiated by the data types. So we have four bit integer and two bit integer data types. And the four bars in one of the group represents the same topology with different levels of pruning applied. So 50% means the topology has been reduced by 50% of its output channels on each of the layer. So the complete topology is on the left. It's always kind of the smallest bar. Then the 50% is next to the right, then the 25% and then the 12.5%. And that's then basically reduced to 12 point, uh, to, to, uh, to an eighth of its original size. So as you can see, there's not just some benefit, but it's huge for both machine uh, MLPs and the CNVs. So quantization from 4-bit to 2-bit brings 3.4x benefit in inference per watt. For CNVs, it's even 5.5x. And with pruning, I gain 49x and 74x respectively. So significant energy efficiency for pruning and quantization is, is possible. Now, you might say, you know, quantization and pruning are kind of obvious, but what about data flow? How much do I gain from that? And how much does logic nets improve over this? So here you can see from a generic 8-bit uh, integer implement neural network accelerator instantiated on the same device, right? Um, scaling this with reduced position and data flow we gain over a thousand X improvement in energy per inference. So this is a, a, a huge deal. Now, can we save any more going from there than to logic nets, right? Um, you would say an, a two bit integer representation is already, already highly optimized, but amazingly, when you go from there to logic nets, you're gonna get another 3.6 X. So overall, there is over 4,000 X energy improvements through post-silicon hardware specialization, right? So amazing this degree of redundancy and, and you could call it waste stitch that's, that's still in the neural network and that we can find. And that's what we're really excited about. So there's really a lot of scope of further um, improvements. And this was just the starting point. So then let me give you a couple of more specific examples. This from the cybersecurity space carrying out line rate classification with nanosecond latency. So basic block diagram, you have ingress and egress network interfaces, some packet processing feature extraction featuring and uh, um, uh, triggering the malware detection, which then passes the results to a packet filter, which will either pass or, or drop. So the first example is a FIN implementation of a malware classifier trained on the UNSW dataset. We've uh, quantized it to two bit weights and activations with close to floating point accuracy. And we can run this with clock rate uh, if, um, inference rate. So this is 300 megahertz circuit uh, classifying at 300 million inference per second with 18 nanosecond latency. And by the way, this fits in 8,000 lookup tables. Remember the large devices would have millions of them. So this is a tiny hardware circuit. 
Here's another implementation. This is still work in progress. This is a DDoS classifier trained on the CIC data set. Again, quantized down to two-bit representations on floating point accuracy. It's currently running at 19.2 million inference per second with 52 nanosecond latency, which is already pretty good, but there's no reason why we can't crank this up to 300 million yet. So that's yet to come. It's currently on 18,000 lookup tables. Still work in progress now. Um, to show you a little bit more diverse examples, this is modulation classification where we actually had uh, one of the previous challenges hosted by AI for Good. Um, so where you're basically just trying to figure out what, uh, what modulation schemes have been used in your RF spectrum. The challenge here is you want to progress towards gigahertz sampling, right? Um, which translates into millions of inference per second in terms of throughput again. Here is the, uh, the, the results that we have achieved. You have throughput on the y-axis. And again, you want to get towards giga samples per second on the, and it's by the way, logarithmic, logarithmic x-axis on latency. So you want to be as low as possible. Here are the typical GPU behavior over different batch sizes. We have server class uh, GPUs with the V100 and some embedded GPUs. And you can see for small batch sizes, the GPU will be lowest in latency, but not achieve its full throughput potential. Only with a high number of batches, you get towards the high throughput. But uh, and here for the server class GPU, this was be 256, but it comes at an incredible latency penalty. And this is the low latency uh, data flow implementation on an FPGA. So that gives you 1.7 giga samples per second with two microseconds uh, latency. So much better suited for these type of, of use cases. Another really um, uh, small example to demonstrate the diversity, it's kind of more esoteric, again, from CERN. Um, so this is actually a, a full classification DNN with 16 binary inputs and five outputs, which we implemented in 30 lookup tables. It's, uh, I mean, it's, it's okay-ish accuracy with its 70%, but the point here really is, that it's actually still a working classifier on a footprint which is smaller than a 32-bit adder. So this is how small you can actually make these neural networks. And it, it achieves three nanosecond latency and over 600 million inference per second, just to demonstrate how small you can actually make these. And this is the last example, much more common or less esoteric than the previous one. This is Minis digit classification. Um, Stone Age problem and rather toy example, but it's popular benchmark right in the embedded space and makes it really comparable. So here are the results we created with Fin and Logic Nets. And, and excuse the, the bit of boasting here, but back at the last Neurips in 2022, Peterson et al. claimed that the fastest MINIS classifier is actually implemented with Fin. Uh, so our research project, here are the results. Um, so at two different accuracies shown, but at 98.4% accuracy, uh, you get 1.6 million inference per second and 12.4 uh, million inference per second for a small accuracy loss using fully binarized representations. Now, how much further can we go with logic nets? So we've created two comparable instances with similar accuracies. With, with those, we can actually scale the performance now up to 517 and 458 million inference sec per second, respectively. That's an improvement like over the binarized neural networks of 300 or, or 37x over an already highly optimized implementation. Latency reduction went down to from 300 and 2,400 nanoseconds to 38 and 9 nanoseconds. And by the way, only for a fraction of the resource footprint. So we're not only created the, the fastest MINIS classifier, unless there's something new coming out at Neurops, but it's, it's even faster now. So and with that, I am coming to the end. We um, want to just briefly summarize, we talked about this long tail of AI applications where we encountered dynamic and diverse requirements and the channel much needed shift towards energy efficiency that I'm convinced has to happen and will happen. 
I hope I could show you that with our adaptive computing technology, we can make a difference here by really customizing the hardware execution architectures with data flow, uh, with shrinking precision and exploiting fine granular sparsity. So all of these customizations bring huge energy savings and data flow in particular allows us to address the diverse requirements, shrinking into sensors, um, achieving nanosecond latency for CERN and so forth. And LogicNet trumps it all with regards to efficiency, size and performance. So there's huge scope for all of us for energy savings in current implementations. To address the rapidly changing workloads in the space, we really need to speed up and automate the specialization process for graph compilers such as FIN, as well as training libraries such as Prevedas. They are essential to the solution because it's not practical to custom create hardware architecture to this degree, one by one for every deployment. And finally, I hope that the proof points convince you of the energy potential that we have here and that it's possible to address these truly diverse requirements. Before we finish, just like to highlight some resources for you that might be interesting. There is the heterogeneous accelerated compute clusters, which are intended to support research in heterogeneous and adaptive compute. Uh, computing. They provide bare metal access to the adaptive compute hardware, so you can really work on all levels. They come with a community which shares designs and infrastructures. There are already more than 100 institutions now. So if you're interested, check out this link. And similarly uh, to this, we have the HPC Fund, which is about accelerating science in the public interest. And they provide you cloud access to AMD CPUs and GPU technology. Uh, the HPC Fund offers customized training, e-learning sessions, and many networking opportunities with peers around the world. So just to say, if you're interested to get involved, check out the links on the slides. And with that, uh, thank you so much for attending and paying attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mikera. It's Are it's a great pleasure. To, yeah, it's a, it's a great pleasure to see you again. Thank you very much uh, for that excellent talk. Um, while while we wait for uh, questions to come in, uh, I had uh, as usual. <laughs> I'm the curious one. So so yeah, uh, I I want to ask you to share your experience on one particular thing. See. Um, you you listed down the, the network use cases, in fact, non-network use cases as well, with CERN and so on, and uh, intrusion detection and so on. Uh, now, now, if I take a new use case, uh, one of these new use cases, so say, let's say, I, let's say I'm a starting researcher, I would like to start one of these use cases, which are hot these days, digital twins, <laughs> or, or something like that, right? Or, or, or joint, joint sensing or, or something like that. So if I take one of those use cases, I want to go through this pipeline, which you just now described. Uh, I'm guessing that the pipeline looks like Pravita Spin and FPGA. That, that, that's the pipeline that you talked about, right? Now, could, could, you, could you explain, if I'm a starting researcher, I want to go through this pipeline, what are the considerations and, and the complexities that I need to be aware of when I use this pipeline? Okay. Oh, great question, Vishnu. So I, I think um, the first thing is first, um, you know, what type of expertise is needed for leveraging this flow, right? Um, and there's, first of all, there's, um, you know, it, uh, some basic machine learning expertise needed because you need to train your neural network and you have that in, in, in any case. And then we have it semi-automated to generate hardware designs of it. So we hope that some of the complexity in the hardware design process has, has gone away and, and, and makes it more um, user-friendly for, for a broader skill set. The best way to judge it is to use some of the example designs. So we have a lot of 
on when you go to the GitHub page for Finn, you will find a lot of example designs, right? They come with Jupyter notebooks that you can step through through all 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 the individual steps in the pipeline, and just see on you know is this something that you're actually comfortable with. We also have uh, a lot of we we regularly run tutorials at uh, conferences, and we also have recordings of these tutorials made available. So it's, it's, it's quite a lot of training materials. So that might be a really good starting point just to kind of get a better understanding of the flow and whether that's something that could work for you. And then you would have to go and look at the specifics of the use case, right? Because it is, um, I always say it's horses for courses, right? There, you you would not do this with a large language model. To put, for example, an extreme example, like super large topologies will create a super large hardware resource, right? And and that might not fit. Um, for those architectures, you know, something where you have thousands of layers, you have to go back for a more iterative uh, execution approach on on a GPU or something like this, where you schedule one layer after another onto onto your hardware accelerators. So there's just kind of an uh, an analysis of the compute and the memory requirements in your example, which would be kind of the 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 next step to understand um, whether, to get an estimate of whether the throughput performance hardware resource costs that kind of fit what you're trying to achieve. And, and then it's a, it's a measure to assess whether there is anything with regards to customization, which is, I think, one of the biggest problems that we have in the AI space, right? And it's just kind of every, every, every week or month, there is a new operator or new data type is actually seeing whether, um, the necessary for uh, support is uh, in the tool chain or how much development work needs to go in cool yeah that's that's uh, that's a lot yeah thank you very much i i think i think that's that's really useful can i ask you a follow up yeah, how much how much um timeline are we talking about is this in your, I mean, roughly speaking, ballpark. <laughs> so, if you take if you take a new use case, am I talking about like six months of my research time, or, or is it like a couple of years, or, or what, what, what is your experience? Oh, it, it has a huge difference. <laughs> it's not simple to answer, right? So, if you have, so for example, uh, remember on the cybersecurity slide, I had. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, there is. Uh, on the cybersecurity example, I had two instances. One was the UNSW, and the seven one was um, uh, the DDoS classifier. And the DDoS classifier was done by somebody else, and he literally pulled that off within a month. Um, why is that? Because um, well, he's familiar with with FPGA, so I think that certainly helped. He's a smart guy; that helped too, and. Uh, more importantly, all jokes aside, I mean, the neural network was simple. It was similar to enough to the examples that we had. So it was super fast, right? Um, but if you come with a, um, a more, you know, uh, we had a student who was working on a semantic segmentation implementation, and that required development of new layers in, in the kernel library, it was much more involved. So this was 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 six months to to twelve months the implementation, and that comes back to your original question, right? It it's um you would have to first do a quick analysis, and again, this is something that we can help with, right? We can look at an example and say, no, nah. <laughs> you know, you you don't want to go through this. It's not a good fit. Or we we could say, yeah, there's this is a great fit. You're gonna get excellent results, but uh, it will require a little bit of development work because you're intrude, intruding a new custom layer in your neural network that is not supported yet. Wonderful, yeah. I, I, I remember your previous point about large language models. I think that, that's, that's, uh, that brings to the question of whether you are doing your analysis, upfront analysis correctly or not. Really interesting. Um, uh, I want to just uh, switch switch gear and ask you about um, uh, how uh, how would one monitor these kind of architectures? I mean, it, 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 your charts are really impressive. 
so so i'm wondering how did you measure this um would you uh, your your soft ai stacks are quite impressive as well i mean in, in your pre, in your early part of your presentation and previous presentations as well you had laid down this ai stack quite nicely but on the monitoring side when i am running this uh, how do i monitor this are there tool sets are there libraries which will help me to do that you mean for performance and power yeah 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 um so it depends a little bit on on the platform that you're using so the the hub clusters that i mentioned at the end right which give you experimental platforms to work with fpgas so there you would have the FPGA would sit on an accelerator card, which comes with uh, a runtime and, and a, a whole environment to use it. And that allows you to pro power consumption right on a continuous basis. So that that, that will give you the, the um, power over, over time profile. And uh, you would get similar tools for, for the GPUs also from other vendors, right? So that makes it really nice for, for doing comparisons. It also uh, gives you an API for doing uh, performance monitoring and measurements. Um, I believe we have published example designs uh, that help with this. And I think that's that's really important. The On the embedded platforms, it's uh, it's almost easier. Um, so we, we used, uh, so for example, this, this um, example between a standard neural network accelerator, uh, data flow implementation and logic nets, we used an embedded platform and we just measured the power of the entire platform. And it's a little bit easier because you don't have a CPU and and that all, all PSU overhead and all in that. No, it's just, just the board, everything that's included. We run everything in the same chip and then we make changes to the computer architectures and we measure uh, power for the whole platform and with regards to um, uh, execution time you can so how do we measure for example uh, 18 nanosecond latency right so so that we can do by actually instantiating monitors in the FPGA so it's it's like a, a logic analyzer or an oscilloscope you can literally see the waveforms as they go into the neural network and when the results are coming out. Great, thank you very much. Um, maybe if I can squeeze in one more question, uh, you know, um, um, the 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 points of flexibility. Where where would uh, this flexibility comes to the advantage? Uh, I believe I believe uh, uh, you you mentioned use cases to implementation. I mean, I think you call it DNN to bitstream. That's the way you put it. So yeah, I, I would call it use cases to implementation. That's that's a good example. Uh, I think the second example, which I believe you mentioned, is this parallel training and quantization. That's where it's another point where I could guess that all, all right, this kind of flexibility is is a good advantage. Um, uh, I uh, I would think of um, updates. I mean, I mean, uh, periodic updates or something like that. Uh, but are there other places where this kind of flexibility is really an advantage in the use cases that you have seen? I'm I'm not sure I understand your question. Do you do you refer more to the um, agility of the solution or um, the flexibility to target different devices, perhaps? No, uh, the 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 first one, the agility of the solution. Yeah, I, I think the, the key benefits of the agility is, um, uh, to one extent, is being able to adjust to different um, deployment scenarios, right? It's, um, you know, let, let's say you have a neural network, uh, maybe cybersecurity is a good example here, that you want to deploy in in the data center, but also have the same neural network run on end devices, maybe on your mobile phone or 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 a client platform, right? So actually having this agility to scale the solution up and down is is without massive redesign effort. I think that's that's really important. Then 
uh, as we discussed earlier, the, the ability to change fast for evolving standards like you would have in the 6G space, right, where, um, you know, the, the tasks get refined over the years to come. So being able to, to adjust as fast, the ability to adjust to new data types, um, let, let's let say, you know, your, your machine learning, your data scientist engineer just figured out that he's getting amazing accuracy using logarithmic number systems. So actually having this agility for, for recreating the solution fast and also the ability to to explore different um, design space compromises. So for example, a customer might say, right? They say, okay, we're gonna build an FPGA platform for, for this. And then they want to understand how much does it cost? So what type of device do we, and then we can actually create solutions. Well, you know, if you were to spend um, $500, right? Then you could, you would get, let's say 500,000 inference per second in a medium sized device. Let's then you say, well, uh, it's a bit too slow. Can I go faster? And then you could say, well, you spend another $200 for the larger device and then you get a double the speed, you know? So, so actually being able to, to, um, to regenerate the design for, for different, uh, cost points um, is also really interesting. I think it's it's one of the most important aspects about these stacks is that that it gives you the the agility to customize for for different targets. Great, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, there is a question from Guillaume. Uh, Guillaume is asking: FPGAs are great at X accelerating integer quantize models, but uh, transformer models depend on floating point. Uh, so what is the direction which your team is taking towards supporting transformers in uh, Bravitas of in based flow? Okay. Um, so so for, first of all, the question regarding floating point versus integer data types. So I wouldn't rule, first of all, I wouldn't rule out integer data types for, for transformers. Um, FPGAs are, are in terms of floating uh, point performance, not uh, much lower compared to a GPU, but sometimes it's not necessary to, to have the hundreds of tera ops of floating point performance. So for smaller transformer models, for example, vision transformers, uh, they are, or even actually in the wireless space, I've seen a, a publication from Ericsson. This, these are quite small transformers and you can implement floating point and they are supported, for example, through the DSP operators. Um, that might be perfectly um, interesting. We, we have not a transformer example in our example library, but that's some, one of the things that's on the horizon. Great, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for thanks, Mukera, for patiently answering all the questions. And uh, I remember, I remember the exciting challenge that we had. We 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 hope that you are able to give us another exciting challenge in yeah, future. Yeah, yeah. We are working <laughs> yeah. on it. We're we're hoping to Great. have one next year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah. sure. <laughs> then uh, we will <laughs> we will see you there. Uh, let me let me hand it back to Mia. Thank you very much, Mukera. Thank you, Vishnu. Uh, yes, I would also like to personally thank you for a very exciting and interesting talk today. Um, I'm just going to close off the session. Thank you everyone who joined and participated today and for sparing your valuable time as well. Um, we do have more sessions planned in the near future, so please check the AI for Good program page for more details. Again, thanks everyone for joining today's session, and I wish everyone a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mia. Bye. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions, like and comment, share links, complete the poll, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. We invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits, poster boards, the eShop, and build your personalized AI for Good program. Let's shape the future of AI for Good.
the AI for Good Global Summit convened by ITU recognizes the joint responsibility of governments, the private sector, United Nations agencies, academia and others to ensure AI reaches its full potential while preventing and mitigating harms. And it's a moment that calls for action. And today I'm calling on each of you, each of you to use this summit to help the world to better understand what kinds of regulations, what kinds of guardrails we need to put in place right now. So together, let's make it innovative, let's make it safe, and let's make it responsible for all. Thank you very much.